Okay, in this video we want to look at the symmetric group and different ways that we can classify elements of the symmetric group. So let's just recall that the symmetric group on in letters is given by, we generally call it Sn, and they're bijections from the set 1 through n to the set 1 through n. And so since they're bijections from one set to itself, that means that's going to form a group under the operation of composition of functions. And then let's also recall that we have this cycle notation for writing elements of the symmetric group. So if we have this sigma in S5 given by the following permutation of 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5. So 1 is sent to 2, 2 is sent to 1, 3 is sent to 4, 4 to 5, and 5 back to 3. Then we can write that in cycle notation in the following way. So we would write sigma equals this 2 cycle, 1, 2, and this 3 cycle, 3, 4, 5. And so we read that as a function. If we're passing a number from the right through this function, then it's sent to whatever's next in the given cycle, given the fact that these loop back on, on themselves. Okay, a couple more definitions. So a K cycle is a permutation that's of the form, so it's just a single thing, A1 to AK, where those AIs are between 1 and N, and that's it. It's just one thing like that. And so it's easy to prove that every element from the symmetric group can be written as a product of disjoint cycles. So uh, we won't prove that here, but that's proven in another video. And then furthermore, a two cycle is known as a transposition. Okay, so the first proposition we want to prove is that any K cycle can be written as a product of transpositions. And since any K cycle can be written as this product of transposition, transpositions, any element from Sn can be written as a product of transpositions. Let's recall that that means they can be written as a product of two cycles. And so the proof here is constructive and it's quite simple. So all we need to do is take a K cycle, A1, A2. Let's put the next to last thing in there, AK minus 1 and AK. And notice that's the same thing as uh, the following. A1, A2, so that transposition, A2, A3, all the way up to AK minus 1, AK. And so you can easily check that these are the same. So for instance, let's notice if we pass A1 through this, it's fixed by the first um, K minus 1 of these transpositions that it uh, passes through. But the last one sends A1 to A2, which is exactly what this does up here. And then so on and so forth. You can check that these two are equal pretty easily. And so that actually finishes this proof. And then the next thing I want to show is that this decomposition into two cycles or transpositions is not unique. And that's actually uh, super easy to show and it's based off of the fact that if you compose a transposition with itself, you get the identity. So notice we have one, two, three. That can be decomposed as transpositions as one, two, one, three. And then that's also equal to 1, 2, 2, 3, 2, 3, and then 1, 3. Because uh, 2, 3, 2, 3 is the same thing as the identity um, permutation, which we generally write as 1. Now, there's obviously a more interesting way to write this as a product of transpositions, but I'll let you guys find that for yourself. The important thing is that this is not unique. But notice, even though it's not unique, we do maintain something here in that this first representation as transposition, transpositions writes it as a two transpositions, and the second one writes it as four transpositions. So actually, the parity of the number of transpositions is invariant, and that's actually something that we're going to prove in this video. Okay, I'll clean up the board and then we'll move to the next result. Okay, this next result we want to prove has to do with combining transpositions together into the identity. So we want to show that if tau1 up to tau r are permutations in Sn, and they're all transpositions such that their product is the identity, then r has to be even. Okay, so we're going to prove this by induction. 
So uh, let's notice that if we get r equals 1, um, it's impossible. Because it's impossible for a single um, transposition to be the identity because a transposition has to permute exactly two things given the fact that a transposition is a two cycle. So that's actually all we need to do. And so now that means that we can assume that R is bigger than or equal to two. And um, notice we can write the final two transpositions in the following way. And by the final two transpositions, I mean in this product T1 through TR. So we're writing um, TR minus one TR as one of four possibilities. So that first one is A, B, a, B, which is equal to the identity. The second one is B, C, A, B. But now notice that's the same thing as A, C, B, C. And so uh, you can check that those two products of transpositions are the same. It's pretty easy to check that. The next thing is C, D, A, B. But since those are disjoint uh, permutations, they commute. So that's the same thing as A, B, C, D. And then finally, um, A, C, A, B, which that can be written as A, B, B, C. Okay, so if you look, if you've got two transpositions, you have these four cases. They are either exactly the same transposition, they um, contain one of the same numbers. In this case here, they both contain B. Um, they contain none of the same numbers, so they're disjoint. Or this final one, they contain one of the same number A, where A is uh, thought to be um, special in some sort of way. And the important thing here is that notice in all of these cases, we have either decreased the number of transpositions we have because these combine together to the identity, or we have moved the last appearance of A to the left. So notice all of these contain A in the rightmost transposition, but we've, rewrite, we've rewritten them that has moved that last appearance of A to the left. And so that's, uh, that's really important here, is that using this, we can move the last appearance of A to the left. Okay, good. And so that's actually going to form um, the setup for this proof. Um, and so I'll clean up the board, I'll move this observation to the top, and then we'll move on from there. Okay, so uh, let's suppose that the number A appears in the trans transposition TR, sorry, tau R. So we just argued before with that very simple calculation that we can move it to the left. So we can move it into TR minus one. Now, the next thing we wanna do is continue to move it to the left. So continue moving the last appearance of A left until one of two things is going to happen. So uh, first, maybe we'll call this case one, and that is the resulting, um, so, so the resulting uh, final appearance of A is A with B prime, and it encounters its inverse. Okay, 
And so what I mean is that we've moved A to the left, and every time we've moved A to the left in its transposition, this second number changes. And it stops changing at one point to B prime when it encounters its inverse. And when it encounters its inverse, it's going to um, vaporize into the identity. So what uh, we get in that case is that we get tau 1 up to tau r is going to be equal to tau 1 prime up to tau r minus 2 prime. Because we've eliminated that guy and we've eliminated its inverse, so we get that right there. But we know that this is equal to the identity by our assumption that tau 1 to tau r is equal to the identity. But what that tells us is that r minus 2 is even by our induction hypothesis, which tells us that r is also even. Also, that's sort of obvious if r minus 2 is even. Okay, good. So I'll clean up this case 1 and then we'll do case 2. Okay, so now case number two will be that this uh, transposition a b prime never hits uh, its inverse. In other words, um, the first occurrence of a moves all the way to the left. In other words, we have written the identity, which is equal to tau 1 up to tau r, that's kind of by our assumption, that's going to be equal to a b prime, so we've moved, moved that all the way to the left, and then tau 2 prime all the way up to tau r prime. But this is the, the last occurrence and the first occurrence of A. Remember, we took this occurrence of A and we moved it all the way to the left, which means all of these guys right here have to fix the number A. But that's a huge problem because that tells us that if we send A through this function on the right, all of these guys are going to fix A. This is going to send it to B prime, but then it follows that the identity, when it attacks A, it's going to send it to B prime. But remember, the identity is supposed to not do anything to A. It's supposed to send it to A. And so that's a contradiction. So that's actually impossible. In other words, case one is the only possibility that we can reduce the number of transpositions, um, which tells us that we have finished the proof of this lemma. Okay, I'll clean up the board and then we'll look at uh, the next theorem. Okay, so the next thing we want to prove is the following. So if we have two sets of transpositions, tau 1 to tau m, and tau 1 prime to tau n prime, where when we take the product of either two of those sets, you get the same thing, then that doesn't mean the transpositions are the same. That means that m is congruent to n mod 2. So the number of transpositions isn't the same, but it is either, but they are both either even or odd. Okay, so let's uh, see the proof here. So the first thing that we'll notice is that um, any transpositions inverse, so I'll just denote that by tau i prime inverse is equal to itself, tau i prime. And that's pretty easy to check that um, if you have a transposition, let's say it's tau equals a, b, well then obviously you're going to get tau squared equals the identity, which is the same thing as saying that it is its own inverse. So what that means is that we can take this equation right here, which I'll denote star, and we can multiply both sides of it by the inverse of this right-hand side, and that's going to give me the following equation. So tau 1 to tau m times tau n prime up to tau 1 prime. So I've just right multiplied by tau n prime inverse, which is itself, and then all the way reversed up to here we get tau 1 prime. Okay, great. But now that's going to give me the identity. Essentially what I've done is just uh, multiplied by the inverse of the right-hand side of this equation. Okay, but now what we know is that um, the number of transpositions on the left-hand side is even, and that's by the previous lemma. In other words, m plus n 
is congruent to 0 mod 2. So that's the same thing as being even. Great. But that means that m is congruent to negative n mod 2. But then it's easy to check that n and negative n are congruent mod 2. In other words, if n is even, then negative n is even. And if n is odd, then negative n is odd. So from that, it follows that m is congruent to n mod 2, which finishes the proof. Okay, so now that we have this uh, notion of writing uh, permutations as a product of transpositions, and the number of transpositions that we use is always either even or odd, then uh, we can define an evenness or oddness to permutations. And so sigma and Sn is said to be even or odd respectively if it can be written as a product of an even or respectively odd number of transpositions. And notice we have this observation that follows from the lemma at the beginning of the video that this k cycle a1 to ak is even if k is odd and it's odd if k is even. So let's just start, remind ourselves of this. a1 to ak can be written as a1, a2, a2, a3, all the way up to ak minus 1, ak. But notice that this is exactly k minus 1 transpositions. So in other words, um, if k is odd, k minus 1 is even, um, which makes this an even element of Sn. And if k is even, then k minus 1 is odd, making this an odd element of Sn. Okay, good. I think this is a good place to end this video.